I'm doing these little studies on birch wood panels that I bought just unprimed online and then I sanded them down and sealed them off with a amber shellac and the, what the shellac does is it just seals off the wood and so that there's a layer between the wood and the paint uh, that stops the wood from being damaged uh, from the oil paint soaking into it and so it creates this absorbent surface and I got it in an amber color which is really nice because it's really reminiscent of like a yellow transparent oxide paint but it's just the shellac itself. And uh, I've heard from several artists like that they've liked to use this, uh, this color for landscape painting outside that it kind of creates this really nice lumosity. And uh, I've done it a, a bit and it's really nice. And so I've been really enjoying to work on it with this color and build up like a translucent layer from having such a, such a vibrant imprimatura that's has nothing that's not painted. So it's not adding on or taking away from the, from the surface texture. In this first pass on the study, I'm just working with a very limited palette. I'm just using ivory black, castle earth, English red, yellow ochre, and of course, lead white. And I'm keeping this extremely compressed because I'm focusing on finding the continuity between the object as a whole. And on these later stages, I'll be focused on finding uh, the difference and the, the antithesis of the continuity. But I think it's extremely important to establish a strong sense of unity between the object. It is one fennel, it's not separate pieces put together. And so it's, I think I find it very helpful to start with that mindset that it is one object, regardless if you're doing a fennel or a figure or even a multi-figural composition, it's one story, it's one object. And then as you develop that, you can start finding those, those secondary elements to it, um, the, the play within the unified whole. And a tip I learned for still life is that you have to do it counterintuitive from how you read a book. From when you read a book, you read it top to bottom, left to right. But when you're designing and building a still life, it needs to be grounded. The object needs to feel like it is heavy. It is solidified on the ground. And it also needs to feel that it has that correct sense of depth within the object, especially if you have multiple objects relating together. And the, the powerfulness, the potency of a still life comes from that foundation, the, the ground, the, the cast shadow, and the, the solidity of the meeting points of the surface and the object. And so it's extremely important to work from the ground up, from the bottom of your objects up, so that you really get them grounded and solidified in the surface. Because the most common mistake that I would make and a lot of my colleagues make uh, with starting still lifes is to have these objects that just feel ethereal and kind of floaty and airy and they're just not solidified on the ground. And I've also seen from the very best of the still life painters, they can paint a book and it just feels so heavy that you just can't see yourself picking it up. It's just so incredibly heavy. And I think that's a very um, powerful way of designing a still life and something that I'm looking for with these uh, exercises that, that I'm doing. Now, as you can see, the actual values and even temperature of, of the background, the object in the foreground vary a lot from nature. And I'm making these executive decisions not to deviate away from nature, but to accentuate how I see the object and to focus on the fennel. Um, I'm compressing this in a way that I'm trying to draw your eye into the fennel and to be able to see the, the, the solidity of the object. And sometimes you know, paint is uh, very much limited compared to reality. And so we have to make these choices. And by making these choices, we can, uh, accentuate certain elements and uh, put focus away from other elements. And so by, by compressing this background and pushing it a bit darker and then really finding that contrast on the object, on what er area of the fennel is coming closest to me and what, what area the, the edge quality needs to be accentuated as extremely soft and subtle as it's going into the distance. I'm making these decisions not uh, empirically, but more of of sculpting this object into three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. It's very conceptual, but still extremely based on. I keep thinking about the difference between a photograph of a vegetable or a fruit and then a painted version by Chardin. And you think the photograph is so much more realistic, right? You, you can't get any more realistic than a photograph. But these paintings that sh by Chardin, you can taste the strawberry in them. You can taste the fruit, the crunchiness, the texture of these different objects. And so, you know, at what point, at what point is an object real or what, at what point is an object an accurate 
uh, representation of it in paint. And when you see these great painters, it's kind of a blurry line when it's, it's not exactly clear, you know, what makes something realistic. Uh, because, you know, if it, even if it doesn't look 100% photorealistic, it, it breaks those boundaries up so that your other senses can go into play. And it's quite an amazing thing to be able to make someone taste and smell and feel an object with just smudging paint around on a surface. It's such a, such a powerful skill to be able to have. And I think that's one of the, the ultimate goals of a still life painter is to be able to, to, to play with people's emotions, with people's senses in uh, a way that photography and other uh, medias can't.